I've had a situation a few times lately where something was being assembled that's made out of plastic, so it has a plastic piece on the top and on the bottom, and there are metal components in between. Sometimes these components get put in the wrong place or they get dislodged, and you'd like to be able to see what had gone wrong. If you simply break the thing apart, it might dislodge them even more and you wouldn't know exactly what went wrong. The obvious joke here is that if you had an x-ray machine, you could see exactly what's going on and that would be great. But there's all these rules about x-ray machines and they're costly and, and all of that, so that's not gonna work. It also isn't that important. But when you're dealing with these problems, your mind starts to turn and you think, how could I get around this? How could I, how could I see inside this, this thing and see what had gone, what, what has gone wrong. And it, it occurred to me that, you know, magnets of course would pass through it, and that if you had a magnet below and a, a Hall effect sensor above, and you passed the part across it and kept track of where it was, you could make a graph of that, uh, you know, the change in the field, and then maybe produce an image from that. So the problem with magnets, of course, is that they're not like x-rays or something else which goes straight through it and, you know, is very easy to turn into an image. They do all sorts of funny things like a, a piece of metal is over here and the, the field can get pulled over there and, and do things like that. But it also occurred to me that this would be a great opportunity to figure out if I actually understand convolution because even if you had some weird impulse response to a small piece of metal going through there, I mean, theoretically, you could just deconvolve it and have a good uh, view of what, what went through, or at least that's you know my current understanding. So the reason why I hadn't pursued this in a more serious way is that I didn't really expect it to work. I'm not positive that it wouldn't work, and I'd kind of like to try this just in 1D right now, just take a piece across and, uh, and look at the response and try and deconvolve it and see if it has any, any value at all. My original plan to ensure that measurements got taken at even spacings was to set this thing up on the milling table and use something like a magnet and another Hall effect sensor on the, the shaft to trigger it. But that would be every tenth of an inch, which is a little coarser than I wanted. And I also realized that I don't really care that much because this is just a super quick see if it works project. We've got things set up right now and they're looking pretty good. We've got readings streaming from the Hall effect sensor. And one of the first things we want to make sure of is that we're not saturated on either end of our sensor. So I'm going to push it down a little bit and we can see that it drops and then rebounds. Lift it up a little bit and we get a spike on the reading there. So that looks good. My screen cap software on the computer was having a fit last night so we're picking this up the next day. Which is why you can now hear the bugs buzzing outside. But what I have here is my setup and a piece of steel TIG rod and I'm going to use this to pass through and get my impulse response for a for a you know infinitely small impulse. I've decided that this is infinitely small so I'm going to pass this through and we can see that we've gotten a nice spike where it ramps up on each side. And I'm going to take something wider like this and pass it through at exactly the same rate. And we can see nice ramp up and then a sort of a steady state and a ramp down, which is what we want. So we should be able to deconvolve that and see a nice, a nice crisp start and end, which pretty much describes this part here. So we have a hole right here. And ideally, if I pass this through, I would be able to see that hole but I can't, it looks exactly the same. And even if I go back in here and move around and you just can't get any, any real signal there. And I think that that's because the field lines are just flowing around it. Um, you know, these are coming up and, and going back around and this hole is just too small. I think it probably has to do with the relative size of the magnet also since it's larger than this hole. So what I did was I made a larger hole on here which is the same diameter as the magnet. I've uh, drilled that out, and so I'm going to pass this through and see if we can't see that. And we can. We have that dip there, which is pretty neat. Obviously, this is sort of a minimum usable pixel size, at least for the ratio of the, the current diameter of the magnet and how far away it is and, and the sensitivity and all of that. I'm going to put some numbers on this. 
and see what the actual output looks like if I run it through Octave. Before I got into the actual numbers, I always think it's good to do some test things and make sure that you understand what you're talking about. So I've set up some numbers here, for example, A, and A is my signal, whoops, that is coming in. So it comes in, has some very crisp things, it goes to one, and there's a little bit of noise here at the end. So that's pretty nice. And I have also the impulse response for that, which is just a, oops, which is a triangle, sort of smooths it out. So we would expect to see a smoother version of that when we convolve them together. So what I'm gonna do is find the result of convolving the impulse response with A, do that, and then I'm gonna plot that result and we're gonna look for the more smoothed out uh, result, which is what we get. Those sharp corners have gone away and they have some more smoothness. Now, if I was to deconvolve this, since I already typed some of these commands in, I'm gonna deconvolve that result with the impulse response. So going in reverse and I should get the same thing back out. So I hit that and bam, here we are. It matches exactly, everything's great. Here we are with the real data. So I'm gonna plot the raw data and I have a 4K screen, so it doesn't scale all the stuff well in Octave, but here we are. We have the steel TIG rod here. We have the solid part with the small hole in it here, which you can't see. And then we flipped it around and we have the big hole over there. Over, and this is all over about 700 samples, just a little bit of noise. So that's some pretty good data. We're gonna take this as our impulse response. So I have just that saved into its own array. It looks pretty good. And all we have to do now is deconvolve this and we're gonna see fantastic results, right? So we'll calculate the result, we'll deconvolve these, and then we'll just plot the result. And here we are, what appears to be just about nothing, and then it oscillates wildly out of control at the end. It's hard to see those numbers over there, so let me hit that big font function again. And you'll notice that we have some pretty pretty massive numbers here. Six to the 36th. <laughs> Actually, before, before I scaled some of these numbers, it was giving me exceeds floating point errors because they were up in the, to the 99 power and all of that. I was exceeding it for the, for the plotting thing, not the computer, but in any case, something was going on. So I scaled them down a little bit. That helped some there, but they're still absolutely massive. So clearly what I need to do is just crop uh, the end off there. So I'll do that replot it and we just caught the oscillation in a different part well that's no matter i'll crop it just a little bit more all the way down to 200 and as a matter of fact it doesn't matter where that you go what it's really doing is oscillating here just exponentially i guess completely out of control so that is not encouraging so it turns out of course when i spend quite a bit of time looking into this that the the noise is what really throws this thing out of whack and even if we go back to here and I take my impulse response, which is this. Okay, so I'm gonna create a second one. Well, actually I already did. So there's one called IR2. So this one's just a straight triangle. And if I take, and instead of deconvolving it with the impulse response that I used to create it, so this is the one that I used to create it and it gives me exactly what I got back out. Then I have the impulse response, which is slightly different. And if I use that to deconvolve it, well, looky there, we get a wild oscillation completely out of control. So I looked into this and there's quite a lot of info about filtering and how noise affects it and all of that. And I looked into it a bit, but this is just way more than I can get into right now. Um, you know, this is a whole field that, that people focus on. So in any case, I definitely learned that my understanding of convolution was correct on a conceptual level and if you do it with nice numbers but as soon as i ventured into the wild i really uh, got my butt kicked so <laughs> i need to do a lot more research and a lot more practice um, and maybe come back to it some other time but the magnet thing actually worked somewhat well if you're willing to concede on the the size thing uh, that makes it completely impractical for what i wanted unless i used a much smaller magnet it was just a fun experiment anyway so i'm not really bummed out um, I didn't really expect it to work, as I mentioned. So 
In any case, it was a fun little project. Got to do some magnets, talk about field lines and say other cool words like that and Hall Effect sensor. And I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.